Like, look at our bag, <laughs> look bro. At the, like, look at the budget of production we were working. Look at with. the artwork, man. Someone buy this for five thousand dollars, please. Hello, welcome back <laughs> to Corks and Controllers, where um, we talk about body positivity. Body positivity and uh, and love, wine. Love yourself and wine. Yeah. Oh, yes. Lots of wine. <laughs> lots and lots of wine. Welcome back. I'm your best friend, Victor Afrisio, aka the Gizmo Gadget, and join us as always is the beautiful and wonderful Jesus Counselor. Yes, I am also Victor, your second best friend. Uh, Mr. Victor, what featured wine are we drinking today? So today we are going for something near and dear to me. Quite arguably, if not uh, factually correct here, my favorite winery in the Central Coast region of California, maybe even the Central region of California, period. Mm -hmm. Uh, There is another one that has my heart strung, you know, so in between Westbrook Wine Farm and this winery, these are my two loves for Central California. And that, my good sir, is... Tablas Creek. Wasn't that so dramatic, you guys? Like, oh my god. Like, look at our bag, <laughs> look bro. At, like, look at the budget of production we were working on. Look at with. the artwork, man. Someone buy this for $5,000, please. <laughs> but, yes, so today we are going back to Tablas Creek, which we have featured before on this show. So today we have what is known as their bread and butter, which is the Cote de Tablas Rouge or Red for you non-French wine speakers. Not to be confused with bread and butter. Cor- oh my God, yes. No, please do not confuse it with bread and butter. That's a whole different animal. <laughs> this is a wine of pedigree, of class, of grand eminence. So Tablas Creek was started. If you, I think I've already given you guys the spiel of uh, the partnership between Chateau de Beaucastel and Chateau Neuf de Pop and... Um, Tablas Creek, started by the Haas family. Uh, Mr. Robert Haas was the man who founded Vineyard Brands. They are a wonderful importer that have many uh, great names uh, to themselves, including Chateau de Beaucastel. Uh, but this specific wine is important for many, many reasons. The main one being that this is usually people's first experience of what uh, Tablas Creek is about. So they specialize in Rhone's. And Mr. Victor, would you do me a favor and read me the grapes that are on the label at the very bottom? Of course. You know, it's, you know, it's funny. We had we had almost the same thought in my brain. I was like, I'm going to quiz Victor on the percentages of grapes. Oh the God, ball. no! I will fail on this one. I will fail on this <laughs> and one. And you went the nicer one and be like, help me introduce this. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we have 44 Grenache, 33 Syrah, 19 of. Oh, how do I say that? Cunes. Cunois. Cunua. Oh, of course. I'm sorry, guys. And 4% Mouvedre. Um, yeah, those are fancy as hell, and I'm sure very delicious. Uh, yes. So with Tablas Creek, they specialize in the Rhone blends. So they pretty much imported all of their grapes from Chateau de Beaucastel, uh, so they could have true authentic clones of each individual grape. So Tablas Creek makes two base wines, one called Cote de Tablas, which is the red, and then the Cote de Tablas Blanc, which is based on Grenache Blanc, Roussin, Marsan, Viognier, and a few other white grapes. Excuse me. (laughs) So, oh, that tasted like basil and tomatoes. My God. Why don't I lose weight? Why? (laughs) Not just kidding. Very nice. Uh, So the Cote de Tablas is modeled to be after, oh man, it's hard to put the analogy. So in the Rhone Valley, you have what's known as... uh, in the example of Chateau Neuf de Pop. So you have your actual AOC Chateau Neuf de Pop wine. That is your top charmer, like top of the appellation system there. Below that, you have what could be considered, uh, to some degree, your surrounding appellations like Vaquera, Gigonda, Slirac. Um, and then below that, you have uh, just your generic uh, Cotes du Rhone red blends. Um, and then below that, you have your Vin de Pie. So Tablas Creek roughly structured their tiers in the same way. So at the very top, you have the Esprits. There is one exception to that that I'll talk about later. Uh, But you have the Esprit, the Tablas Rouge and Blanc. That is made to be their equivalent of Chateau de Bop. Below that, you have these guys, which are the Cote de Tablas. These are modeled to be after closer to like a Vaquerus, a Gigondas style of red blend. 
Um, and then below that, they have the Padelin, the Tablas, both Blanc and Rouge. Uh, that is more of like their Cotes du Rhone, uh, red and white. So the Padelins are made to be drunk upon release. The Cote de Tablas do taste better with the little years of age on them. This is a 2022, so it could realistically go another 5, 10 years before it tastes truly amazing. Uh, then you have your Esprit de Tablas, both Blanc and Rouge. Those, please age them for at least 10 years if you have them. Don't drink them, please. 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 Uh, like I was saying, though, there is one exception to those Esprits. Uh, that is the Great Panoply. So, Chateau de Beaucastel in Chateau de Pop in the Rhone Valley mm -hmm. has a special wine called the Hommage à Jacques Perrin. So, it is a... The proper title, or the full name, is Chateau de Beaucastel, Chateau Neuf de Pop, Hommage à Jacques Perrin. Oh my God. So that is a majority of uh, Mouvedre. That's the main grape there. Tablas Creek has a similar wine called the Panoply, which is their version of the Hommage à Jacques Perrin, which is uh, mostly Mouvedre. That one is a bit pricier and comes in its own little fancy-ish uh, little looking bottle. I mean, it's the same bottle shape. It's just you could tell it's a different pedigree. Um, I do sincerely hope that Tabas Creek one day makes a white version of the Panoply. So mm -hmm. Chateau de Boca still has their Roussin Via Le Vigne. Uh, I would love to see Tabas do something like that. But enough of all this yipper yapper. Let's get some wine in the glasses. All right. Man, uh <laughs> If you didn't see it, Victor uh, confused here earlier, it's, it's, it's because you can't find the cork uh, screw. I can't, I can't find the cork. I didn't want to make too much noise, but now that we're drawing attention to me, I might as well make all of them. Uh, yeah, it's not in here. <laughs> you know, it's been a few weeks, too, that... Um, I'm, I'm always impressed with the way I'm on way off mic. Uh-oh, I heard an oh god. Ah, you found one. We found one. Just hold on to that handle. <laughs> oh, God. Okay, I see why you said, oh, God. Um, uh, it's been a few weeks since we recorded. Uh, I'm always impressed consistently and end of, uh, end of, uh, of, of impact of the just off the noggin knowledge and wisdom that Mr. Victor has. But it's been a while since I've heard it <laughs> that I was just like... The pronunciation. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Now you guys know how I feel when Victor talks about tech and video games. Please. That's how I feel. I feel so stupid at times. I'm like, oh, my God. I should know what a fucking MG3 is or whatever the hell it is that he's talking about. <laughs> mm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Ah, satisfying little pop. Satisfying pop. So, Mr. Victor, I'm going to show you this cork because this cork has a wonderful little thing on there. Pop quiz time, everybody. Mm -hmm. Pop quiz. The letters D, I, A, M, Mr. Victor, mean what on a cork? The, oh, the DM cork. Uh, what did that mean? That just means that it's made of a specific tree or like the quality of the tree or something like that. Okay, you're not too far off. Is you're there a special, is there a special thing that this cork does? It is... Oh, it is rated for, uh, you know, the the lifespan of when you're trying to age your wine. That is fairly, fairly close. Dang it. So, these corks are guaranteed to be free of something called trichloral... Trichloral... Oh, my God. TCA is trichloral... Asinine? Trichloral adenosine? I can't remember exactly. It's TCA. So, it is a uh, cork taint. So, the way that the DM corks are structured is that they go through a very intense, I guess you could say, purification slash sanitation process where they pretty much destroy all the TCA molecules. Mm -hmm. But what Mr. Victor was alluding to is that all the DM corks have in very tiny little letterings, like right there, um, it says DM and then a number next to that. So, that number is indicative of how many years that DM guarantees this wine to, or this cork to last. Can't quite read it. I think it says 10. That, maybe is, a, more. that is a DM 10. Okay. So, that means that Topless Creek is banking on this wine to make it to at least its 10th birthday. Now, these corks can easily outlast that. Um, I've seen DM 1s, 3s, 5, 10s, 20s, even 30s. No! Um, Chateau Montalena is one of the best examples. Uh, their Chardonnay comes with a DM30. 
Mm-hmm. That means that they're guaranteeing that little, you know, $60 bottle of Chardonnay to go that long. Yeah. But without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, the 2022 rendition of the Cote de Tablas by Tablas Creek. Now, my, while Mr. Richard pours the eagle eye among you, would probably recognize that these are very large stainless glasses that aren't our usual glasses. And that's because uh, <laughs> the, the time in between recordings, uh, we had a little accident. We got a fallen soldier. Accidents happen all the time. Yeah. So peace or uh, RIP to our fallen soldiers. Mm. Dude, I just love how this smells. Already it smells like fruity, toasty, savory, refreshing, juicy. Mm, refreshing is right. Oh, my God. I feel like I just breathe in, like, some nice, clean ocean air. Oh, my God. And the taste? The taste is so clean, so fresh, so light, juicy, and flavorful. Oh, my God. It just cut through all of my overtly sugar, sugary coffee. It's like, it doesn't exist in my mouth anymore. But tell me, what do you taste? Isn't it, like, so just pure and gentle and, I don't know. It's just a very soft, juicy, easy-drinking wine. <laughs> Why does that taste like the airheads I used to eat? And tr- okay, elaborate. What do you taste? There, there's a, there's both a blue airhead, which is like a stretchy taffy kind of uh, overly sugar taffy kind of candy, and there's a and there's a white packaging one too that's like the mystery flavor, but everyone knows it's like raspberry or whatever. Um. So, Mr. Victor, what like, you are oh. telling me is that you are tasting both red and blue fruits in this wine. Mm-hmm. So, he's not mistaken. Grenache will almost always showcase bright red fruits. So, think of like your cherries, your strawberries, your cranberries. And then, <laughs> Kunwa can, oddly enough, showcase more of your purple slash blue fruits. So, think of like blueberries, blackberries, poison berries. This tastes exactly like candy to me. <laughs> Which isn't a bad thing, right? No, but it's like... It's like, as you said, refreshing, like airy as well, too. So it's like. So this wine, what I love about Tablas Creek is that they are in an insanely hot region in California called Paso Robles. Paso Robles in the summer can easily get to like 109, 111. It's like these poor vines are getting scorched to the goddamn earth day in, day out in the summer. Somehow, let me give you this perspective. Usually when a grapevine is exposed to a lot of sun and a lot of heat. It causes the vine to just absolutely shoot up its sugar, pretty much. Mm -hmm. So if it was on a scale of 1 to 10, you know, like in Oregon, peak summer, you're probably looking at like a 5 or 6. In Paso Robles, peak summer, you're probably looking at like a 9. I mean, it's very concentrated sugar amounts. Uh, That leads to exorbitantly high alcohol levels. So there was a running joke amongst us while we worked at our mutual job that if you saw a bottle of wine and it was from Paso Robles, you could probably expect at least 15% alcohol. And for the most part, that's true. Uh, The highest I have seen on a retail shelf has been 16.9 for a Paso Robles uh, Zinfandel. So keeping that in mind, somehow Tablas Creek is able to not foster their vines into behaving well. But you get Grenache that is predisposed to be alcoholic as shit, even in its homeland of Chateauneuf de Pop. I mean, 15% is not unheard of to being, you know, in a bad year. Mm-hmm. Um, this wine, being 44 Grenache, 33 Syrah, 19 Cunoan, 4% Mouvedre, is only 13.5 alcohol. That is uh, an insane amount of talent being transcribed into that bottle mm-hmm. to showcase its freshness. This is a wine that, oh my God, with tacos, with a cheeseburger, with literally just about anything that involves meat, fat, or cheese would be fantastic. Just because it's high in acid, it's lowish on tannin, it has this refreshing, just, I don't know, juicy fruit, not really juicy fruit kind of character to it. Um, And it is a wine that truly will get more complex and better and more silky slash aromatic with time. So I would say... If you can uh, splurge on a bottle of Cote de Tablas, I would say if you can, wait at least six years. At least six years. Um, Ten if you are really, really patient. Um, And you will be richly rewarded. (laughs) So, 
What do you think, Mr. Victor? I think it's fantastic. I think I have were the perfect... You, were you searching your dinner? <laughs> oh, that was earlier. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I think I've thought of a wonderful game to pair with. I'm just freaking its name. <laughs> Okay, you know, so Mr. Victor is too uh, humble himself to tell you he was struck with uh, an illness that has killed a lot of people in the past. Ah. And um, he survived. I survived. Second time. Second time. Christ right? Almighty. Oh, yeah. Yeah. The first time was, like, immense. I was just, I was just like, shivering in cold sweats, being like, this is it. This is my last day on Earth. Oof. And then this time you're like, ah, eh, whatever, I'll live. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Both both times, both times over the the hump. This hump was like way much much more smaller. It was always the next day where I was just like, oh, <laughs> so jealous. I'm so jealous. I, I still have so much youth left. I don't know what to do with it though. Um, gosh darn. I really think that like in your past life you were like this like triathlon runner slash Olympian who you know had the freaking, I don't know stamina of a fucking horse because there's no way in hell that anyone else on this planet can eat the way he does with the lifestyle he has and be as fit as he is how many it's, health problems do you have mr victor like none um health problems by the way like physiological i may or may not have a deviated septum okay but that's not <laughs> Uh, I don't know, atherosclerosis or diabetes or high cholesterol or... It doesn't make it hard to breathe, though, so I do have that. <laughs> True, but with the biking, it helps, does it not? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Gosh, okay, the, the problem with this shooter that I have in my head is that it's a really great, it's a rare shooter with a uh, with a story unlike Call of Duties or Valorant or the Overwatches of the world um but it has a really 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 generic title that's easily forgettable Mortal Kombat uh no nah, that's a fighter The Hulk The Hulk <laughs> Um gosh darn it Ooh. is it Itadaki san No not this time <laughs> <laughs> God, like I can't. It's Hiroshi San. I don't remember the name of the setting or the characters. <laughs> I know Nolan North voices the main character. He just remembers the vibes. I remember the vibes. It was in a desert. I'm freaking. What's the? <sighs> what is that you remember about it though? Like what made you think about this game? Is it Shanghai? What's that really, really rich? Crazy rich Asians. Uh, city. Like it almost looks like it's in the future. Abu Dhabi. No. Dubai? Dubai. It's set in Dubai. An alternate reality of Dubai where uh this is the it's just absolutely crushed by the environment and like the, the sand dunes like took the city back. It's not Dune? No. <laughs> not Dune. What the fuck? Oh god. I guess I could start that game set in Dubai. And then put sand dunes. Oh gosh. Oh my god. Oh my god, I found it. Okay. What was it called? It is called Mr. Victor. Spec Ops the Line. How the fuck was I ever gonna get that? Exactly, right? The most generic Spec Ops the Line. The most generic name for a military shooter you have ever heard in your life. It sounds like it came out Spec on Spec Ops? I have never once heard that in my life. It sounds like a forgettable PS2 game. Spec Ops? It sounds like a disease. Oh, yeah, I was diagnosed with Spec Ops last week. But it actually came out for the PlayStation 3 around to, uh, 2012. I believe, uh, yeah, 2012. That made, was 14 years ago. Made by Jaeger Development. Oh, my God. Who I think is now closed after they tried to make a live service game recently. Uh, the, the live service game uh, nowadays is a big bet that a lot of developers are willing to try to make. But with, you know, with Titans like Valorant and like Fortnite and all that stuff, it's hard to, you know, get the gamers attention when they rather play those behemoths the ones. And they ended up losing a lot of money and closing. And that's what happened to Jaeger. But before that happened, they made a. Absolutely. What the shit is this? 
uh, take for a military shooter? So usually when you think of a military shooter like Call of Duty's or Battlefields, you think of, you know, the single players is like you're some no name guy because they're supposed to be like player avatar characters where you're supposed to pretend. Sorry, this is like them. bugging the shit out of me. What the hell is this thing called? Oh, uh, that is a that's a croc. A what? A croc. A croc? A croc. What the hell is that? It is a little tree imp who uh, uh who hides excuse, oh a what? A tree imp. What the fuck is an imp? They're like little fairies basically and like they hide in trees. They're they're tree spirits. Kind of like Studio Ghibli car- creatures. Ghiblis. Yeah. And uh they're from the Legend of Zelda. They hide throughout the game you have to find them through environmental puzzles. And what what is so disturbing about this? I don't cute I don't guy? know. It's uh it's cuz he has a little butt. No. <laughs> it's disturbing you. It's I don't know. It's uh <laughs> I really don't know. There you go. You look more metal. metal. There's another one behind you. What? Oh, yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> I am not going to sleep a night. Oh my god. I'm not sure the camera part doesn't reach that far, but uh, No, but I can see it and, and it can see me. The entire bit in the Legend of Zelda games is that they hide. I will go plant more seeds tomorrow. Please leave me alone. Sometimes in plain sight. And so I bought like a four pack of these guys and I hid them, hid them around the house. So, you know, let's call that motherfucker up there spec ops because that's what that <laughs> one is. I would not have once guessed that that thing was up there if you had not told me. <laughs> and I've looked at this goddamn wall so many times. Yeah, it's very impressive. All, all my little toys. But anywho, go uh, on, spec ops. So yeah, so usually when you think of generic uh, military shooters, you think of no name player avatar characters where you know they don't say anything uh because you're supposed to just pretend you're a military guy shooting you don't talk there's not really much story you just go from a to b shooting all the russians or chinese or whatever the enemy is in that game all day long um so a lot of times the stories are very uninteresting so jaeger took the approach of being like well hell let's make an interesting story first and a shooter second and what they have done is um they made a game that's set, like I said, in alternate reality, Dubai, where it's just like, it's, it's actually taken back over by a giant sand dune. Uh, let me put pull up some gameplay so Victor can stare at it while I tell the, the audience about the rest. Um, and yeah, um, so usually the biggest like cognitive dissidence when you're playing these games like this is that um, you, you're 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 not essentially you are a mass murderer just like fucking mowing people down and there's like zero consequences in the game or in like whatever facet of reality that you want your brain to live in and it doesn't match up with the player character uh motivations or like contextually right because like in between scenes they either don't say anything or they're just like oh man it's hard that john got shot he was my best friend and it's just like are you disconnected from the 700 people you just mowed down those lies didn't matter or whatever so that's the problem so jaeger went like okay let's make a game where the story is (laughs) the more you're in this environment this war conflict the more fucking disconnected from reality you feel and the more where you just cannot tell right from wrong the more we kill, the more it's just like, well, what the fuck? Like, you know, you start losing your mind. So, um, so yeah, I forgot to pull the game. Uh, and yeah, it's a really, really interesting game. Uh, gameplay wise, I would actually say not entirely interesting. Let me mute Oh, that. wow, machine guns. Uh, brr, 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 brr. Uh, let's just fast forward. Um, but in an early scene, in the early scene of the game. Oh, he has a black eye. Oh, Christ. Oh, my Lord. Uh, in, an, in an early scene in the game. So which, th- which one are you? This isn't much uh, spoilers. Uh, you're this guy. Oh, you're not the one getting beat up or beating up? Uh, no, those are, those are just people. Uh, oh, yeah. no. Oh, no. Oh, my God. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, so, so really, really messed up war crimes happen uh, throughout this entire game. That's, but, a, that's a war crime? That, but, uh, that looked like a straight up assassination. Um, but yeah, but an early big conflict of the game, this isn't spoilers, this is like, the, like within the first 30 minutes of the game. Uh, uh, you, you come up on a, an enemy encampment and, uh, and, uh, you need to get through it 
to get to your objective, uh, which sounds like a standard like gameplay situation uh, that a lot of shooters do. Um, the problem is that they don't have the ammo or the manpower because just three people on a squad uh, to get through it. And so they were just like, we have to get through this and we don't have that much time to do it. But we do have like white phosphorus, uh, you know, bombs. What the fuck? And then they're like, what the fuck? Don't use those. Those are super fucked up, like a weapon to use. And he's just like, fuck that. We got to get through here. And like, it becomes clear to the rest of the teammates that the squad leader, who is the one you're playing, is kind of playing loose with the rules and being and just kind of being like a means to an end, kind of whatever. Uh, and it's and it's because the environment is kind of like getting to him. He's just like it's like it's all fucked up out here, anyways. We we might as well just get our mission done. And so they drop white fives first bombs on the encampment, and they go and they go. Oh, okay, awesome. All the flames are gone. Let's let's go through. Turns out that encampment had a bunch of civilians at it that the enemy insurgents were protecting. <laughs> Sorry, I chuckled. Um, I play I play this <laughs> game a lot. I played the game a lot, so I'm numb to it now. <laughs> when I first played it, I was just like, I need to turn this off real quick. Um, and yeah, and so it's like there's a lot of scenes like that, uh, of like that grave of situations, and like uh, a lot of morality to it. And that's a, and that's like the biggest thing. A lot of military shooters don't really get into the morality of it. They they do like this fake morality to it, where it's just like. If we don't do this mission, the United States is going to be threatened. And it's just like, from what? From one big terrorist guy. He's like, what is he going to do? That, oh, that's why we have to stop him. And it's just like, that's too vague and granular and whatever, blah, blah, blah. This is like really honed in on like individuals' morality. Like the, your team's morality, your morality, the morality of enemies that you meet. And so, but the reason why I bring it up for our wine is because... Like the environment, it's a very harsh, very hot, very ah. just, just blistering like kind of conditions. Unforgivable environment. But like, and you gotta, but you gotta get through it. You have to nurture it. You have to pay attention. You have to be very patient with it, because when you get to the end, you have a very refreshing <laughs> story uh, that is rarely told in military shooters, and. And when you get to the end, you're just like, wow, so well-rounded. So like, it gives me a lot to think about, uh, you know, like, you know, just like in at the very end of a really good book and like you actually, and like one of the rare moments, especially in this era of the PS3 and Xbox 360 rare, where you actually put the controller down and think about what you just played. It was a little more rare back then. Now, nowadays indie games are, being a lot more thoughtful, even smaller games like Celeste, uh, you know, make you think uh, about like you know the hero's journey, like the, another take on the hero's journey, and uh, and yeah, that's my pairing. Uh, but Victor's win scene is just generic third person shooting. Uh, yeah, he has like to watch the cut scenes, assassinations to, uh, to left and right. That I'm like, bruh, what the hell? It is. You are. It is a very tactile, very like nice shooting mechanics they feel really good for a third person shooter but on the surface it looks very generic you have to get to the cutscenes to really appreciate it like it's one of those animes where it's just like look you see a lot of boobs and butt but if you listen there's a really good story I swear it's almost that situation yeah. but with violence um, oh, oh. wow Wow, uh, this was a deeply uh, philosophical pairing. I would concur. No fire in the camp. See, um, no ruthless insurgents would ever put a sign like that up. They'd just be like, "Fuck you!" I'll just shoot you. I think you nailed it on the head with the unrelenting uh, extreme environment, and you have to somehow manage to make a good thing out of that. You know, uh, that's exactly what Tablas Creek does in Paso, and oh my god, that's what you'll be doing in Spec Ops if you can. Uh, the same way those grapevines handle all the UV rays, all those nasty predators and little attackers and all these other nasty things that are trying to kill them, you will manage that in Spec Ops too, I guess. Mm. But Christ almighty, what a game. Yeah, but I mean, what an environment too for Tabas Creek. I mean, they picked a very volatile area to showcase that, hey, these grapes can do well here. Hell yeah. I think that is a 10 out of 10 pairing. Grab a bottle of Tabas Creek. 
drop some white fires for us on in, innocent civilians. And, uh, <laughs> see how your evening goes. <laughs> I shouldn't laugh at that. Oh my god, I'm going to hell. No. Well, <laughs> I keep chuckling too. So, join us, won't you? <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. Uh, yeah, no, excellent pairing with Superman. Nice here. down here in hell. Um, uh, we're sweating. Look at us. Ooh. Okay, official paired for this episode. Tablas Creek. With the boondocks. Costa Tablas. What's this called again? This? Carl. Yes. Oh, I thought it was a boondock. Uh, where did you get that? I thought you said it was a boondock. <laughs> Wait, what's it uh, called? A Korok. K O R O K. Boondock sound the same. Boondock Saints is a good movie. Boondock Saints. I learned so much on this show, you guys. So much. Mm-hmm. Um, what's his name from the bad guy from Spider Man? Uh, he was a Green Goblin. What is it? Doctor Strange. No, <laughs> Doctor Strange isn't. Well, he's a bad guy sometimes. He's a bad guy in the comics. Uh, God damn it. Bad guy in Spider Man. That's not the Joker. Uh, the guy who's the Green Goblin. Who's who's that again? Isn't he the Green Goblin? He has that funny face. The actor. I'm talking about the actor. Oh, I don't know the actor. I mean, oh, that, that's asking a lot, man. Damn. That guy. Gwyneth Paltrow. Octavio knows what I'm talking about. Put that guy on screen. Yes, that guy. This guy, yes. That guy cross-dresses in uh, Boondock Sings. Anyways. <laughs> Tally-ho and happy Tuesday. <laughs> what did you think of our pairing? Uh, if you have any alternative uh, suggestions for the pairing, if you, if you think you got a better one, we'd love to hear it. Uh, if you need... If if you got like a very important dinner coming up with your partner and they're meeting their parents, your parents for the first time, and you really need a good wine, just shoot us a comment. Or oh, yeah, of course, That's definitely. Fine. Yeah, <laughs> we are all eager, and just like if you also are about to have some friends over for video game night, you want a recommendation of what these people enjoy? Let us know. Just play Mario Party. <laughs> Uh, he has said that before, but he will change that tune when you tell him that your friends are into shooting people. Uh, well, for video game purposes, obviously. It's a very, very important uh, distinction to make. All right, bye. Alrighty, bye, bye, everybody. <laughs> oh, wait, hold on, no, Octavio, don't cut it. I forgot to do the thing. You, please like and subscribe. Comment yes. down below. Uh, yeah. Itadakimas. Is that what I said at the end? Uh, um, sumasen. Sumasen. Uh, I thought it was Tadaki Mouse. Que tal? Yo. We speak in German? Yo estoy. No. Did it? Ich habe eine Frage. Ba- bye. <laughs> Goodbye. Like ni hao mao? Buenas noches. Oh, you're speaking Spanish! Oh. <laughs> I was all uh, like, is he doing French, Italian, Chinese, <laughs> Mandarin? Don't. Don't install Biblioteca. <laughs> <laughs> Donde está la biblioteca? <laughs> that, that's good enough. <laughs> Goodbye, everybody. <laughs> oh, <man. laughs>